Hi everyone! In this video, we'll be analysing Wilfred Owen's exposure. So, who is Wilfred Owen? Owen was born in 1893 in Shropshire, England, and he died at battle in 1918. He wrote poetry since he was young, and at one point worked as a lay assistant to a vicar in Oxfordshire. In 1916, Owen was enlisted to fight in World War I, becoming second lieutenant in the Manchester Regiment. A year later, he was wounded in combat and was hospitalised in Edinburgh, during which he met Siegfried Sassoon. Sassoon would go on to become his mentor, friend, and some have even speculated his lover. In 1918, Owen rejoined his regiment, but died shortly after while leading his men in France. Most of Owen's poems were published posthumously, first collected in the volume Poems of Wilfred Owen, which was edited by Sassou. To this day, Owen is known for being one of the best war poets of all time, and his works tend to show warfare in a grim, realistic light, which is contrasted against the more jingoistic, romanticised view of predecessors like Rupert Brooke. I will now read the poem, but if you wish to do that yourself, you can click pause and return to the video once you're done. Our brains ache in the merciless iced east winds that knife us. Wearied we keep awake because the night is silent. Low drooping flares confuse our memory of the salient. Worried by silence, sentries whisper, curious, nervous, but nothing happened. Watching, we hear the mad gusts tugging on the wire, like twitching agonies of men among his brambles. Northward, incessantly, the flickering gunnery rumbles, far off, like a dull rumour of some other war. What are we doing here? The poignant misery of dawn begins to grow. We only know war lasts, rain soaks, and clouds sag stormy. Dawn massing in the east, her melancholy army attacks once more in ranks on shivering racks of grey. But nothing happens. Sudden successive flights of bullets streak the silence, less deadly than the air that shudders black with snow. With sidelong flowing flakes that flock, pause and renew. We watch them wandering up and down the wind's nonchalance, but nothing happens. Pale flakes with fingering stealth come feeling for our faces. We cringe in holes, back on forgotten dreams, and stare, snow-dazed, deep into grassier ditches. So we drowse, sun-dozed, Littered with blossoms trickling where the blackbird fusses. Is it that we are dying? Slowly our ghosts drag home, glimpsing the sunk fires, glossed with crusted dark red jewels. Crickets jingle there. For hours the innocent mice rejoice. The house is theirs. Shutters and doors all closed. On us the doors are closed. We turn back to our dying. Since we believe not otherwise can kind fires burn. Now ever suns smile true on child or field or fruit. For God's invincible spring our love is made afraid. Therefore, not loath, we lie out here. Therefore we're born, for love of God seems dying. Tonight, this frost will fasten on this mud in us, shriveling many hands and puckering foreheads crisp. The burying party, 
picks and shovels in shaking grasp pause over half-known faces. All their eyes are ice, but nothing happens. Exposure opens with the speaker and his fellow sentries waking up, migraine-stricken, exhausted but fearful of dozing off again, lest there be another sudden attack. The state of vertigo is reflected in the series of slant rhymes and internal rhymes, which echo within and crisscross from line to line. For instance, ache, awake, iced, knife, home in on the harsh sensations the speaker feels, while the power rhymes of wearied, worried, silent, salient, and curious, nervous draw our attention to the mental state and the wider environment the soldiers are in. And we are, as it were, hit by a flurry of sharp physical and psychological descriptions right from the get-go, which is not unlike the way those merciless iced east winds attack the soldiers' faces in sudden blows. The vowel overlap and silence and happens introduces the ironic tension that besieged the men's minds, as they fear the violence that action may bring, but also crave the predictability of such an action. In their situation, even a violent attack would seem more comforting than the uncertainty of lying in wait, of having to deal with the silence of not knowing when and where bullets will come attacking. And this uncertainty comes full circle with the repetition of the word silence in line 16, when sudden successive flights of bullets streak the silence. As the poem moves from describing the scene in the trenches to the half-dream, half-memories of the dozed-off soldiers in stanza 6, the rhymes become less haphazard and assume a semblance of order as homophones. What emerges from this progression in rhyme is a jarring contrast between the chaotic randomness of the trenches and the domestic harmony of the home. Compared to the frantic, scattered nature of rhymes in the first half of the poem, here we see the homophone of their, theirs, in line 27 to 28, and the repeated words closed, closed, which are syntactically enclosed within line 29. Now, as part of the soldiers' memory of their pre-war lives, these sonic echoes highlight the gap that now lies between the past comforts and their present toils. The repeated closed and closed make the scene especially wistful, whereas the first closed describes the literal state of these shutters and doors back home being all closed, as any house would be. The next clause shows us a tragic irony, as we see from the Piperbaton of On Us The Doors Are Closed, that this closedness augurs a kind of social rejection that these men may receive even if they were to make it back home. So this thing that they're supposed to want the most i.e. homecoming, loses its warmth and meaning. And if what lies in wait back home is antipathy and apathy, then is there really still a point to returning home? Or should they instead turn back to our dying? This irony is compounded by the reference to innocent mice rejoice, the house is theirs. Because what would normally be viewed as vermin in the house have now instead become the rightful owners, leaving the humans to look on from the outside. As we reach the final stanza, the internal rhyme of mud and us seems to conflate earth and flesh, while the frost fastening itself on this mud and us reinforces this idea that in battle, there is no longer a distinction between the grime at one's feet and the man who possesses that very feet. In war, mud is man, man is mud. And this imagery, while morbid, is accurate, just as corpses lie amidst muddy earth. As for their eyes are ice, it's ambiguous who the implied they here refers to. Is it to the burying party? or to the half-known faces that have presumably been frozen to death? Is this iciness a result of one dying for his country, or a reflection of another one's cruelty on his fellow man, or both? Either way, 
Owen suggests through the half rhyme of eyes ice the idea that coldness from death and coldness towards life aren't all that different, which is, of course, a depressing thought. Another source of tension in the poem comes from the pull between its stanceic regularity and rhythmic variation. On the macro level, each of the eight stances are syncanes with a final clipped line, which also happens to be the refrain. But if we look a bit closer, we'll see that there is a striking amount of range in both the metre and foot of the poem. The poem's range of feet is incredibly diverse, with iams, trochees, dactyls, spondees, all mixed into the prosodic frame. For instance, in line 5, 15, 20 and 40, we see the iambic rhythm of but nothing happens, which is also the refrain. And then there is flights of bullets streak the silence, which is a trochaic rhythm in line 16. Then we've got what are we doing here in line 10, which is a dactylic rhythm. And then finally, shutters and doors all closed in line 29, which happens to be spondaic. Now this rhythmic diversity is perhaps a microcosm of the chaos of the battlefield, but of the regiment itself as well. The soldiers may look similar in military uniform and unified in their patriotic duty, but upon closer inspection, they are each a different, complex individual with varying emotions, memories and aspirations. Be that as it may, in the context of war, these individual men are bound by a similar kind of despair and loss of faith. And we see this reinforced by the use of refrains. Now, if we juxtapose the final lines of each stanza, we'll see a pattern emerge as follows. Technically, there's only one perfect refrain in this list, and that's the statement, but nothing happens, which we find at the end of stances one, three, four, and eight. The fact that we begin and end the poem with this pronouncement suggests the triumph of apathy and highlights the grim reality that there is no messianic force or deus ex machina to deliver these soldiers out of their suffering. And as much as we'd like there to be a change in fortune for the better, Owen's view seems to be that such deliverance doesn't really exist, which echoes the crisis of faith that so troubles the speaker in this poem. We see this reflected in the other thread of refrain, from is it that we are dying, to we turn back to our dying, to for love of God seems dying. The refrain of dying shows the all-encompassing breakdown of the speaker and his fellow sentries, as the dying isn't just of the existential sort, but extends also to their philosophical, spiritual and religious consciousness. So it's telling then that when we reach the final stanza, regularity is restored to some extent, as the lines alternate between iambic and trochaic hexameters, with lines 36 to 39 ending on a masculine stress courtesy of the docked syllable, before it reverts to the feminine ending of the refrain, but nothing happens. The suggestion of this is pessimistic. Despite the speaker's desire to retain his individuality, the oppressive force of war seems to be too overpowering for this to be possible. The syntax in the penultimate stanza is especially interesting. But first, let's figure out what the speaker is saying in lines 33 to 35. The word loath means unwilling, But Owen uses a double negative, not loath, to express the soldiers' not unwillingness to be out in the fields. But does this mean that they are actually willing? The wordplay could offer a clue. Because loath could remind us of loath with an E, which means hatred. And this perhaps tells us something about the men's true emotions towards their situation. Are they lying out here in the battlefield because of love for country and God? Or rather, because of a love that's been made afraid, which ceases to be a feeling of love, but instead of terror? 
The twisted, dislodged phrases, chopped up by Sejura in a way that mirrors the men's emotional and mental fragmentation, convey the inner writhing that the speaker feels about this whole business of war. The use of therefore supposedly connotes causality, but the irony here is that everything has now become so illogical, the brutality of war so inexplicable, that the order between life and death, just like the order of the clauses we lie out here, therefore were born, has now become reversed, and the reason for fighting is tangled up in the confusion and fusion of love and fear. Now this point may also remind us of another poem about one's loss of faith, which is Gerard Manley Hopkins' Carrion Comfort, written in 1885. It opens like this. Not, I'll not carry in comfort, despair, not feast on thee. Not on twist, slack they may be, these last strands of man in me, or, most weary, cry I can no more, I can, can something, hope, wish day come, not choose not to be. Like the speaker in exposure, Hopkins' speaker is also struggling with thoughts of despair, as he feels his faith humanity and verbal logic slipping away. Notice that the lines here are similarly jumbled and disorderly, and the shared word not indicating the sense of emotional resistance. Interestingly, Hopkins also uses a hexameter structure in this poem. It's worth noting that English verse doesn't lend itself very naturally to anything longer than the pentameter. So perhaps when poets like Owen and Hopkins decide to adopt the hexameter, they are precisely exploiting the awkward, prodding nature of the six-foot line to convey discomfort and disarray, despite a need to carry and trudge on. Now my final point is about personification, which recurs throughout the poem to bring out another irony about the soldier's situation. For an environment that is so deadly silent, nature and its agents seem remarkably alive, as we can tell from these descriptions. While the humans are hanging by a thread, nature is flourishing in her apathy while she's inflicting pain on man. It's certainly strange to see that the violence at play doesn't really come from the usual accoutrements of war, with the only presence of weaponry being in line 16. Sudden successive flights of bullets streak the silence. Ironically though, these bullets are shown to be less deadly than the air that shudders black with snow. So bullets, which is a human invention, are apparently less powerful than just the bare cold wind, which highlights the harsh conditions of the landscape, but also the relative inferiority of man versus nature. After all, Nature herself is immune from the bullets that men themselves so fear. But perhaps what's most tragic about it all is that while merciless winds hurt, the kind fires of the suns which smile true on child or field or fruit cannot heal. Not the wounded body of the soldier, nor the disillusioned soul of the man. And so Owen uses personification in the poem to show the men, those very persons at war, in their least person-like state, as they are reduced by nature's force and man's own inhumanity. And that's it everyone! If you find this video helpful, please give it a like and subscribe to this channel for other GCSE and A-level English literature videos. Make sure you check out the blog post for this in the description box below and don't forget to leave me a comment so that you let me know what you're studying and what else you want to see from this channel. See you soon!